Good afternoon. My name is Colin Campbell. I'm a professor in pharmacology, and I'm the chair of the faculty and Senate consultative committee. So welcome, everybody. I'm glad that you could all make it today. Before I start, I'm going to read some language just so that um, it will be helpful for everybody. There will be an opportunity to ask questions during the question and answer period immediately following the president's speech. I will be asking President Kaler questions that have been submitted online over the past few weeks and that I had a chance to go over with my colleagues last week. If you are in the audience here today, simply raise your hand and if time allows, I will call on you. I just want to say it's a little hard to see when you're on the stage here, so um, I'll, I'll do my very best to see you, but if I, I won't be ignoring you, it's just sometimes hard to see. If you're watching the speech online or from one of our system campus locations, please go to the President's website at president.umn.edu and you'll find a link to submit a question. And finally, for those of you who tweet, you can submit questions using the hashtag UMNSOTU for State of the University Address, which is what you're we're all here for it today. Uh, it's my, uh, my pleasure, um, it feels a little impertinent, but my pleasure to introduce the uh, President Eric W. Kaler, who is the 16th President of the University of Minnesota. He came here from Stony Brook University in 2011, where he had been Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. The State of the University Address is a tradition that's been going on for many years now, and um, an opportunity for the President to lay out his vision and um, to tell us about some of the things that are going on. I, I understand he's a new grandparent, um, so I, we all wish him the best with that. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce President Eric W. Kaler. Thank you, Colin, and good afternoon. These are turbulent and, for some in our community, frightening times. It seems as if so much of what we stand for as a public land-grant university is under attack. We know of the vile and despicable hate actions that have taken place on our campus over the past year, most recently against our Jewish community, before that our Muslim students, and hateful acts towards women and others. We know that political speech has been vandalized and shouted down, political speech along the vast ideological spectrum, Limiting free speech is wrong and unacceptable anywhere, but especially in our academic setting. We know that recent events have been painful and unfair to our students, faculty, and staff from around the world, as immigrants and undocumented students are under attack. Transgender students and members of our GLBTQ community are being further marginalized. And as a scientist and the university's president, I'm also deeply disturbed by the attacks on our community members and attacks on facts. It is during such challenging times that the University of Minnesota can and must shine. This is a moment of great uncertainty for many people in many ways. But I know of one indisputable certainty, and that is the deep and broad impact our university has on all 87 counties of our state and on just about every one of our more than five million citizens. A way to enhance that impact is to stay true to our core values and ensure our actions reflect them. This afternoon, I want to talk to you about those values, make it clear where I stand, and ask you to join me in embracing them in the days and months to come. First, thank you for coming here today. I do want to acknowledge that we have many members of our Board of Regents with us today. Please welcome Regents Tom Anderson, Linda Cohen, Michael Hsu, Peggy Lucas, Dave McMillan, and Patricia Simmons. Regents D Rick Beeson, Chair Dean Johnson, Abdul Omari, and Darren Roshan could, could not join us here, but I'm sure they are with us either online or in spirit. And I want to welcome to the board two new Regents, Ken Powell and Steve Swiggum, who just started last week. Colleagues on our system campuses have gathered to watch this, so hello to Crookston, Duluth, Morris, and Rochester, and to our outstanding chancellors and colleagues there. I'm happy to see many members of my senior leadership team and deans from the Twin Cities campus. We also have the president of the Minnesota Student Association, Abir Saida, and I'll tell you a little more about her later and President Nicholas Goldsmith of the Council of Graduate Students, President Max Hall of the Professional Student Government, and Trish Palermo, Chair of our Student Senate. Thank you all for being here. Before there was a state of Minnesota, there was a University of Minnesota. Our first president, William Watts Falwell, 
In his inaugural address, emphasized that the university was essential for, quote, the well-being of the state, and he was right. <laughs> As time passed, the partisan partnership between the citizens of Minnesota, all of our citizens, strengthened and became indivisible. It was built on a foundation as broad as the shoulders of Minnesota's miners and farmers and as deep as the principles that have guided Minnesota exceptionalism, a strong commitment to public education, extraordinary health care, and understanding of the value of investment for the public good. Along the way, system campuses took hold, research and outreach centers became beachheads for statewide public engagement, and extension made an impact in all of our counties. Alumni populated every corner of the state, starting businesses, treating patients, teaching students, promoting the arts, running for office, and growing the food to feed our state and the world. Inventions emerged, triggering the creation or the renewal of entire industries in Minnesota, such as the medical device industry, healthcare, mining, software, and water quality enterprises. People across the state who never stepped on any of our campuses cheered for our sports team, looked for us for breakthrough cures and treatments and longed for their children to be accepted as students here. And I know after six years on this job that we are not merely the University of Minnesota. This university is Minnesota. And right now, and it feels like more than ever, the state and its people have their eyes on us. That gaze results from all of the pressing issues that are upon us in them. And in many more ways than not, we can be proud of all we do and of what we stand for for our commitment to research and finding solutions to some of Minnesota's biggest challenges, to our support for inquiry of all kinds and free speech, and for our empathy for the immigrants and undocumented students on our campuses, and to our commitment to equity for our GLBTQ community, to our embrace of the liberal arts, and to our stand for respect and inclusion. We are proud of our Driving Tomorrow Twin Cities Campus Strategic Plan that's a remarkable model of interdisciplinary teaching and research and is living up to its promise for our students and our faculty. We're proud of our affordable excellence and the way over the past five years we've kept a lid on tuition and reduced debt for our Minnesota resident undergraduates. While rising tuition captures headlines, our average increase system-wide has been less than 1% a year for Minnesota residents. Proud of the important work we're doing, we're going on right now to develop a comprehensive system-wide strategic plan to better serve the state, better leverage the strengths of all of our campuses, and vigorously fulfill our 21st century land grant mission. We're proud of the research our faculty conducts, from aiding in pork production to diagnosing autism and to working to close the achievement gap in Minnesota. In the end, for most things and on most days, the state looks to us because, simply put, the University of Minnesota is indispensable. We give this state a true sense of all the possibilities for it and its future. The scrutiny we receive and the hope we inspire calls on us to reaffirm our core values. So what guides us? How can we continue to lead the state of Minnesota? Now, I don't usually quote others, but this from the British philosopher and scholar Bertrand Russell is as relevant today as it was 100 years ago. And here's what he said, and pardon the 19th century gender specificity. He said, if a man is offered a fact which goes against his instincts, he will scrutinize it closely. And unless the evidence is overwhelming, he will refuse to believe it. If, on the other hand, he is offered something which affords a reason for acting in accordance with his instincts, he will accept it even on the slightest evidence. Then Russell added, the origin of myths is explained in this way. The University of Minnesota does not operate on myths. We must not. We must not. We are an, inst an institution that thrives on and relentlessly pursues the truth. We're dedicated to the facts and the thoughtful interpretation of them. Along with a sh set of shared facts, we must also come together around a reservoir of empathy, of humility, and of high aspirations. We must care about each other. 
Combined, that embrace of facts and our willingness to share our humanity with each other forms the basis of our core values. Those values help give us what a great university must have, a sense of real possibility for the future. Now, as Colin mentioned, you should know that my thoughts and feelings today are not only driven by the chaotic news and the headlines or the troubling concerns I hear from many on our campuses every day. They're drawn, drawn by something more personal and life-changing. Two months ago, I became a grandfather for the first time. Her name is Ophelia, and she is beautiful and brilliant. And if you haven't experienced it, there's nothing like holding a nine-pound bundle of vulnerability in your arms, looking into her eyes and imagining all the possibilities for her. So it's my responsibility to lead this university to help build a community and state that is safe, welcoming, and affords equal opportunity to every child, whether they've been held by their grandfather or not. So let me come back to Bertrand Russell's words in the current attacks on facts and science. And let me put on my chemical engineering hat for just a couple of minutes. It is an unavoidable fact of chemistry that the combustion of a hydrocarbon in air leads to the production of carbon dioxide. It is an unavoidable fact that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gases include water vapor, ozone, carbon dioxide, methane, and a few others. And they're called that because they capture outgoing infrared radiation from the planet and they cause the planet to get warmer. Consequently, increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere will cause changes in the convective patterns, the way the atmosphere moves, and the climate we experience will change. And it is an unavoidable fact that if the mean temperature of the oceans increases, the water level will rise. That's because the coefficient of thermal expansion for water is positive. And it's an unavoidable fact that many coastal regions are not far above current average sea level and therefore are vulnerable to flooding and ultimately inundation. That's even before the ice melts. So why in the world would we not plan for this? We don't plan because some powerful voices call climate change or global warming a hoax and well-organized groups with great financial and political power call it a scam. And someone once tweeted, quote, the concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make U.S. manufacturing non-competitive. <laughs> in fact, climate change and what is known as global warming was studied by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a group created by the United Nations, including thousands of scientists from over 100 countries. You might remember that for their work, they shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. And evidence shows climate is changing. So here we are, back to Bertrand Russell's words. We are an institution that is dedicated to the honoring of facts and science, not myths. We are also dedicated to the thoughtful, unbiased scrutiny of culture and values. There could be no wavering. If our ability to conduct our research at this university is hindered by those with self-interest or political agendas, we must fight that. We are committed to academic freedom and to the facts. Our ethos is this. If our studies and research are legal and ethical, we will follow science and inquiry where it leads us. That's at our core. Another core value is free speech. We do a lot to ensure diversity and equity on our campuses and about improving our campus climates as we should. It's a priority. To me, diversity also applies to an openness to ideas and to the freedom to use words to express opinions. Our policy and traditions are clear. In all of its activities, our university strives to sustain an open exchange of ideas in an environment that embodies the values I just discussed, along with the values of responsibility, integrity, and cooperation. In that open exchange of ideas, we must promote an atmosphere of mutual respect, free from racism, sexism, and other forms of prejudice and intolerance. But it's not so simple. There's a lot of shouting in our nation, our state, and on our five campuses these days. Disagreement is essential in the democracy and in the academy. Different people view the world differently. We're allowed to do that. 
I would like to see us get away from constantly questioning people's motives or labeling them simply because they ask questions. Asking questions is the hallmark of education. There also seems to be a new standard that political speech or posters that express a different point of view from our own are de facto hate speech or somehow shouldn't be allowed. It's a standard that says if anyone is offended, those words are not permitted. And those aren't the values of this nation or this university. There are wide points of view on our campuses and in the state that we must all respect. We cannot condone a chilling of conversation. I know that some people on our campuses are fearful of saying how they feel or think and fearful of being attacked for simply expressing themselves. And that includes our Republican and conservative colleagues, peers, and students who, I've been told, sometimes feel afraid to speak their minds in our environment. And that's wrong. So if we don't create an accepting and respectful atmosphere here in this setting of intellectual vitality, who will? Free speech is a core value, and we can't chip away at it. At the same time, we surely can't stand for hateful words or actions. There have been too many of them at this university recently, and it angers and saddens me. It provides an ugly reflection on our university. The recent poster of a swastika on campus calling for, quote, global white supremacy was disgusting. The vandalism last fall of our Muslim Student Association board on the Washington Avenue Bridge was vicious. Other incidents of hate that have occurred are beyond disappointing. We've worked hard on campus climate issues through my tenure and will continue to be a priority. I'm pleased with the way our bias response and referral network on the Twin Cities campus has developed. I know there were early concerns around the network being the thought police or the word police, but it's not that. Its guidelines are clear. Bias response cannot be an infringement on free speech. Our network was recently praised by an independent group for being a national model and for allowing free speech protections in its procedures. But we need the network as a place for all of us to go when we experience, see, or hear biased behavior. We need to promote a culture that honors free speech while discouraging hateful words. Sadly, we can't escape the climate of our times and our nation, but as we have, we must denounce hate at every turn and the bias prejudice, and discrimination that fuels hate. That applies to gender identities of our students, faculty, and staff. I'm proud that we have been open and responsive in our support of transgender and gender nonconforming students, faculty, and staff. And now the Gender and Sexuality Center for Queer and Trans Life and the Transgender Commission are working with the Office of Equal Opportunity and Affirmative Action to develop policies to improve the experience for trans and gender nonconforming students on all our campuses. We must ensure that our policies and practices make everyone feel welcomed on our campuses. With all we're doing on many fronts, the fact is we still have large groups of students who feel vulnerable, marginalized, and perhaps even unwanted. We all have work to do. I surely can't do it alone. But make no mistake, inclusion is another core value and one way we can lead our state. We also have the responsibility to our students who come to us from to our campuses from all around the world. We are a global university with students from more than 135 nations, with a remarkable number of faculty from many countries, and with a history of sending our own students abroad, of being honored with Fulbright Scholars, and with supplying the Peace Corps with volunteers. Globalism is part of us. That's why the recent executive order on immigrants and concerns and, and concerns about the future of undocumented students has been so troubling, frightening, and complex for so many of our students, faculty, and staff. I thank our Global Programs and Strategy Alliance and our International Student and Scholar Services for all the work and care they've been providing to our immigrant and international community during this period of great uncertainty. Right now, we particularly want to take action that reflects our priorities in making our immigrant students and scholars along with those who may be undocumented or are dreamers, feel welcomed and safe. I'm pleased to announce today we're creating a dedicated service that for now I'm calling the Immigrant Immigration Resource Center. It's a collaborative effort uh, with many Twin Cities and system-wide uh, partners, including our Global Programs and Strategy Alliance, 
the Office for Equity and Diversity, the Office of Student Affairs, University Relations, the Office of Human Resources, and the Provost Office. The Provost and I are committed to ensuring that all who are affected by any immigration policy changes will have a clear and accessible path to resources and support and get their questions answered in a timely fashion. We will also provide outreach to the greater university community on issues around immigration, DACA, and diversity. The Provost and I are committed to identifying resources, including a website, and reallocating staff and funding as needed to support this important work. And please look for further announcements as we work urgently to get this team in place. You may also know that our law school recently received the largest gift in its history, $25 million, to help endow our James H. Binger Center for New Americans, which is without doubt one of the nation's best immigration law clinics. We're assisting many people in our broader communities with this center. That gift is an extraordinary example of the power of philanthropy and how a compassionate donor, like the Robina Foundation, can make a real difference in the lives of Minnesotans with the university as its partner. On this critical immigration issue, our re research and community engagement work is also informing our state policymakers, teachers, students, and citizens. It was a recent study commissioned by our University Office for Economic Development and led by Humphrey School researcher Ryan Allen that helped frame the fact-based statewide conversation about the important role that immigrants and refugees play in Minnesota's economy. It was embraced by policymakers across the political and economic spectrum. Our university libraries and our Immigration History Research Center helped develop an immigration syllabus for historians, student, and the students, and the public across the nation. Of course, there are the real stories of our colleagues and students that put human faces on the research, legalism, and politics of what's going on. For me, for instance, during my years of teaching, nine of my 37 PhD students were from all around the world, including two from Iran and one from Mexico. They came here, the best and brightest of their nations, to learn and make their contributions to science and engineering in the United States. Each one of them is now contributing to our economy. I guarantee you, none of them pose a risk to our country's security. Like those PhD students I had the honor to advise, we must ensure that our students, faculty, and staff in this university are safe and treated with respect and dignity. Helping the state to value the contributions of immigrants and undocumented students or neighbors is a job for all of us. To University of Minnesota students who are dreamers and under, others under the DACA program, we support you and we embrace you. And for all of us, I urge you to reach out to immigrants in your classes or your workplaces on our campuses, on campus and in your off-campus activities. Many of our colleagues and students from around the world are fearful, fearful and feeling socially isolated. Understanding, support, and kindness goes a long way. The values of respect and safety are no more important than, we, than when we address issues of sexual misconduct. Recently, our Twin Cities campus, like too many across the nation, has been at the center of sexual assault news and conversation because of the reported behavior of some of our students and faculty. When responding to such incidents, we must be guided by our values and we must take actions that express our priorities. While the university has a strong and comprehensive approach to prevent and respond to sexual misconduct with the guidance of our nation leading Aurora Center, there's much more we can do and need to do, particularly in terms of education, training, and advocacy. Earlier this year, we convened an ad hoc working group to undertake a high-level assessment of our education around and response to sexual assault and to recommend immediate actions across the university to take further training and activity. There's a parallel track of work ongoing to improve the relationship between law enforcement agencies, our campus police, the Minneapolis police, and Hennepin Attorney's Office, Hennepin County's Attorney's Office, and campus resources such as the Aurora Center and the Office of Equal Opportunity and Affirmative Action. Earlier this week, I received recommendations from the group and I will immediately be asking the appropriate units to implement them. They include one, mandatory training for faculty and staff. Not everyone will like this, but the time has come. 
A resolution is moving through faculty governance supporting such training, and we will consult broadly in implementing this recommendation. Two, enhance training and additional education for students after their first year. Three, sustain public health and public awareness campaign. Four, creating a President's Advisory Committee on Sexual Assault that will regularly report to me. And five, developing metrics to evaluate and measure our sexual assault and misconduct prevention, education, advocacy, and awareness efforts on campus, including conducting a campus climate survey every three years. We'll engage both faculty and students in implementing these recommendations. But we all know that even with these kinds of actions, we will not eliminate sexual misconduct on campus. Unfortunately, attitudes and behaviors that underlie violence against women are deeply ingrained in our culture. Some students, faculty, and staff may come into our community with belief systems that will be difficult to change. But what we can do is stand firm on our values and effectively articulate the behaviors we expect and the culture we want to create. To confront all of these pressing issues and to take actions that improve our community requires the ability to synthesize opinions, clearly state our positions, understand psychology, economics, history, art, and make compromises. That requires application of the core values of the liberal arts, the humanities, and the social sciences. They are central to who we are as a university. A friend has said that epidemics like HIV and AIDS and cancer won't destroy the human race, but hatred, misunderstanding, and a failure to communicate clearly can. We have strong and long-standing liberal education requirements for undergraduates on the Twin Cities campus, and they have served us well. But in light of our driving tomorrow strategic plan and its interdisciplinary grand, grand challenge courses, we are embarking on a reassessment of our liberal education requirements. And of course, the University of Minnesota at Morris and our, our new chancellor, Michelle Baer, remains a distinct nationally ranked public liberal arts college that's a true jewel of our system and of our state. Our Twin Cities College of Liberal Art under Dean Coleman has been undergoing some transformations. Some of this is to address the real concern of students and their families about career preparation opportunities. But to me, Active citizenship, ethical reasoning, clear writing, and understanding of history and different cultures, leadership and teamwork are not only so-called commodities for our employers. They are the knowledge that we all need to address the issues facing us today. Free speech, an ability to navigate diverse environments, a welcoming campus climate, and respect for each other. They also help us to better understand the human condition, understanding critical in these trying times. To be sure, our commitment to the liberal arts today and into the future on all of our campuses is a core value of this university. There's one final core value I want to close on, and that is perhaps the most central, the most caring, and the most expected value, that of devotion to our students, to their well-being, their development, and their preparation for this ever-changing and constantly challenging world. Their success is essential to the success of the state. We must keep our promises to them and their families, not only through affordable excellence, but through the growing number of Grand Challenge courses, the advent of a new BAMD pipeline, addition of ag education in Crookston, and many other uh, examples across the system. There are thousands of success stories, 15,000 every year earning their degrees, 67,000 students going to class every day. But I want to talk to you in closing about just one, our MSA president, Abir Saida. Few students I have met here over the past six years have been more passionate, more driven, and yes, sometimes more challenging than Abir. But she's a leader, and this university is proud to have offered her the pathway to build those skills. Six weeks ago, at our annual breakfast to kick off our legislative advocacy program, Abir spoke, and she inspired everyone, including me. That morning, Abir said in part, quote, I look nothing like the U of M. I'm a little brown immigrant girl who doesn't like sports, has never been in Greek life, who does not think in English, who is a Pell Grant recipient, whose parents could not help her with the FAFSA, who is studying sociology and politics and gender, and still doesn't totally know the rouser by heart. 
She went on to say, there are decision makers here and around this state who don't see that as the U of M. And that's exactly the problem. Because, she said, I am the University of Minnesota. I am so profoundly a member of the Gopher community. I, come to campus, I came to campus and I found space, community, and opportunity. I began to see a future here. I began to see a career here. And I began to envision my life in Minnesota for the first time. Then a beer finished this way. When our tuition is low, when our inclusion is high, when our accessibility is great, and when our priorities are straight, that is when students succeed. And that's how we make Minnesota the envy of this country. I could not have said that better myself. And it's because of students like a beer that all of us must work every day to ensure we abide by and live by our university core values. Freedom of speech, a commitment to facts, science, and inquiry. Inclusion and respect for all, including our trans and GLBTQ community. A global perspective that respects immigrants, refugees, and dreamers. A condemnation of hate and a promotion of kindness. Standing firm for a culture that prevents sexual assault. Forming an interdisciplinary partnership with our elected officials that brings our remarkable strengths to the state of Minnesota's long-term needs and putting our students first. These core values can guide us in the days to come. These uncertain times demand it. Our extraordinarily, extraordinary faculty, staff, and students deserve it. And the continued greatness of the University of Minnesota depends on it. Thank you. Well, I, I thought I would start with some uh, a synthesis of some of the questions that, that came in, and then, well, I, like I said, I'll, I'll go to the hall here, and then we'll see if we get anybody whispering in my ear, ear with some other questions. You, President Carroll, you did address uh, many of the issues that are on the minds of uh, the questioners, but uh, so I, it's a little bit redundant, I suppose, but I wanted to give you a chance to follow up. Question is, how, how do you respond to, to individuals who would like to see you issue a stronger statement assuring immigrant students, faculty, and staff of the university's support? And commitment. Well, sometimes the word that's used there is sanctuary, and sanctuary campuses are not uh, are not well defined. And that word sanctuary is a lightning bolt to uh, those in some other uh, political areas who uh, would want to punish uh, a university uh, or a city uh, for doing that. And, and that's all over the press. Uh, but we've made strong statements, and we continue uh, to to be strong in this 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 space. Um, we do not have, nor will we create, a list of undocumented students at the University of Minnesota. Uh, our university police uh, are not immigration agents. They do not ask immigration status as they encounter uh, students. Uh, we continue uh, to provide in-state uh, tuition for undocumented students as provided uh, by university law. Uh, college campuses have been identified as areas in which immigration agents do not make arrests. So I feel that we're providing um, support uh, for those students uh, in the best way that we can. Uh, but as I encourage people uh, in my prepared remarks, um, many of these students are feeling uh, a great deal of, of anxiety, a great deal of fear. Uh, as you know, um, I try to visit uh, departments uh, once uh, every three or four weeks, and I'm about halfway through all of the departments and centers at, at the university after six, uh, six years. And it's a big place. Uh, and I was in uh, a department, and I, I won't say which one and to protect the students' privacy, uh, but one of the graduate students who was showing me around uh, was from Iran. And we had a brief conversation. I asked her how she was doing, and she was quite emotional about that, as was I. And the thing that made a difference for her was when the faculty and her fellow students in that department reached out to her and comforted her. And it's that person-to-person -person kindness that we as a community need to display to the students, staff, and faculty who do feel marginalized and do feel threatened. 
I think you're sort of reading my mind because the, the next question I have was, what well, are... you cut your hair, so it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> what are some ways you personally get involved with the different cultural communities such as LGBTQ, uh, Latino, Hispanic, uh, African American, Muslim, Asian, uh, international students, and many intersectional communities that are not comprised of predominantly white people? How do I... How do you... What are some of the, the I guess, the, the most impactful things that have happened to you. You gave one example. Sure, and uh, I visited with the Muslim Student Association and, and uh, other uh, Muslim groups. I visit with our Jewish communities. I, I visit uh, the Black Student um, Association offices on the second floor. Uh, I'm open, and I want to communicate with, uh, with those groups, and, and I encourage other administrators and faculty members, again, to provide connections and, and, and contacts and, and make people feel welcome and listen to and respect him. I was going to ask a question because there were many, many questions about the sexual assault issue, and I, I'm just going to take advantage of my temporary platform to, to in, encourage you and offer to work with you on the mandatory training for, for faculty around this issue. I think it's just critically important. Um, yeah, I, I think it is. And uh, you and I have had a, a conversation about how uh, faculty readily embrace mandatory training. Yeah, yeah that is... Uh, but this is a situation where, where we have, I mean, culture change is, is a trite and overused uh, statement, but, but we have some bad stuff that goes on here. And, you know, when you look at, at the reports of, of assault um, across campus, in our dormitories, in Greek life, uh, this, we are not where we need to be. We are not showing simple kindness and respect to fellow human beings. We are not enabling members of our community when they see something going on that's not right to say, hey, stop. She's had too much to drink. You need to go home. As a bystander, intervene. And we seem unable to do that. Now, we're not alone in this. You know, we, we took part of the AAU uh, sexual survey, sexual assault survey. Uh, and, you know, we're in the, we're in the mid-range, 22, 25 percent of, of women uh, report being sexually assaulted uh, while, while students. We need to enable faculty to understand how to intervene and how to educate. We, we welcome to, to campus um, students, um, many of whom are 18 years old, and we haven't had very much to do with the first 18 years of their life. That's another problem in our society, but we've got to get a set of, of norms and expectations and behaviors that are better than where we are now. Thanks. Uh, concerns have been raised about potential that the, the, the federal government might alter their guidance around Title IX mandates. Uh, can you share your plans for continued commitment to Title IX and gender-based violence issues at U of M, even if federal mandates change? Sure. We are not going to step back one nanometer uh, from, from where we are. In fact, we will continue to try to strengthen um, our, our commitment to, uh, to Title IX, to equal opportunity uh, for, for women. Uh, what I'm worried about, however, is um, the legal, our legal ability to do that and to maintain a defense against those who don't want us to do that, I think will be eroded if, in fact, the federal government steps back. Right now, we are required by Title IX, by the Dear Colleague letter, um, to investigate reports of sexual assault or harassment. Now, if that goes away, then it is our choice to do that. And I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding is that weakens our ability to withstand challenges. So, uh, again, it's a very, uh, it's a very challenging world uh, right now. Lots of change going on. As you alluded to in your remarks, there's a, a growing awareness that, that conservative and Republican students in our community feel uh, that their voices have been silenced. And, and in fact, the questioners have used stronger language than that. And you, um, you indicated that you agree that this is a problem, which was the first part of the question. Um, and I got to say, it's, it's quaint in a way how the power that people sometimes think that you have in the questions that they, they ask. But uh, what do you think that there are things that, that you can do and initiatives that you can push to help us uh, create an environment that allows people that, that are more, uh, don't necessarily agree with some of the dominant views on campus to feel comfortable expressing themselves? Well, uh, you know, in answer to a slightly different question is that I think that the um, the way to battle uh, hateful speech, speech that you disagree with, uh, is with more speech. It's not with prohibiting that that you don't 
you don't like. And so the, the opportunity for uh, departments and, and centers and institutes, colleges, uh, to organize forums, to actually have a good old-fashioned debate where you take point A, you take point B, and let's talk about the facts, point, counterpoint, have timing, and balance what, um, what people have to say, would be very, very helpful. And I think the other element we need to do as a, as a community is just, as to the very best we can, dial down the temperature a little bit. There is enormous anxiety in our, in our society. Uh, it, is, it is remarkable to read the New York Times, the failing New York Times, um, and the Wall Street Journal. And read, read it, this is a very interesting exercise. I'm sure some of you do it. Read the report of a common event that we all, something happened, but read it from those two different points of view. And then go online and read some alt-right descriptions of what went on. We are in a world where Shared facts are, are a precious, rare resource, and we as an institution need to dial back that, that temperature and, and begin to have real, honest, intellectual, respectful, thoughtful conversations with each other about where we are in the world. I'm going to ask the President another question, and then I'm going to go to the audience just to kind of forewarn you. Um, so in our new political environment, the Minnesota public K-12 school system may face difficult times. They're already facing difficult They're times. They're already facing difficult times. We want a strong K-12 system to prepare all students to have post-secondary opportunities. What support for K-12 schools can the university offer to strengthen their ability to prepare? We are students? already offering a, a, a really pretty tremendous amount uh, of, of support. Uh, many areas in our College of Education and uh, Human Development uh, are tightly keyed into curriculum development uh, opportunities. Um, I'm the co-chair of Generation Next on closing the achievement gap, and we're being able to align uh, university resources uh, with Minneapolis and St. Paul public uh, public schools. Uh, Michael Rodriguez has taken leadership uh, in that in that space in the College of Education and Human Design uh, for me. Uh, we have a program. I'll just take a brief moment of advertising. It turns out that one of the real roadblocks uh, to understanding uh, mathematics by the eighth grade is you don't have a good concept of fractions. And you learn that earlier in your, in your education. So we have a, a well-developed educational tool, which is called Go for Math, Go for Math, get it, um, <laughs> that, we're, that we're piloting uh, in the schools to attack exactly uh, that, that problem. Uh, Scott McConnell, uh, Michael Rodriguez, others, uh, Dean Jean Quam has been a terrific, strong voice in this. Uh, we have an institute uh, for, for principal uh, education that, that is, is very powerful because a real key, if you see a strong school, it has a strong principal. If you see a weak principal, you've got a weak school. And so intersecting at that first level of management is also important. So we're doing a lot. Always room to do more. Have we have questions, anybody from the, we have some roving mics, I think. There's one in the aisle right here. Right. Thank you. Hi, my name's John Frude from the Professional Student Government in the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. I was wondering with your uh, mention for uh, increasing student comfortability on campus and especially within the classroom and especially opening up uh, to the idea of required faculty training. Uh, if that will follow suit into implicit bias training as well for faculty. So the question is whether we would institute a mandatory implicit bias training uh, activity for faculty. Uh, that is in conversation. I'm not quite willing to go to mandatory yet, uh, but we took uh, implicit bias training. I've had some in previous stages in my life, uh, and it's very valuable. And uh, we do... Uh, require it for members of search committees so that we are enabling our search com committee members to look or at least to realize they have a bias and therefore try to deal with it uh, as we look uh, very hard for an increasingly diverse faculty. Not quite there to do it across the board yet, but for search committees we're doing it. We have questions over here. Thank you. 
Um, you arrested 13 students who took over your office, six that disrupted the Board of Regents meeting. And I see you have uh, difficulties to call sexual misconduct by its name, which is rape. So I want to know why, and why is it not punished as you punished activist students? Why, why are, so is your question why rapists accused of rape or sexual uh, assault are not arrested? Why are you not punishing ra uh, rapists as you punished activist students? So um, in many cases, uh, the police uh, do arrest uh, individuals that are, are accused of sexual assault, rape, um, but uh, as the as the police investigate that crime, they reach a, a conclusion, a set of evidence that they um, report to the Hennepin County or Ramsey County attorney or the Minneapolis city attorney. And that uh, attorney's office makes a decision as to whether or not those individuals are going to be prosecuted for that crime based on the evidence that they have in hand, which for a criminal trial is uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Often, unfortunately, those kind of cases are not prosecuted by uh, the appropriate attorney's office uh, because they don't believe that they will be able to get a conviction for those uh, crimes. That's, the, that's how the justice system works uh, in, the, in the United States. So to answer your question, those people, uh, in many cases, if the, police, if the report is to the police, they are, in fact, arrested. The difficulty in prosecuting them, however, is very high. And as you, you saw, uh, perhaps in the uh, Abby Honnold case, uh, it took one of our police officers uh, to devote enormous efforts to, in fact, find two other women that uh, the rapist had raped and was finally able to get a, get a conviction. Um, that's how our, our process works. And again, part of, part of our challenge is that because uh, the burden of proof is so high that criminal uh, penalties are not uh, often assigned. We come back to the to the Title IX investigation uh, at the university, which we carry out, and if we find findings, those allow us to take action as a university up to and including expulsion. But there we require on the on a burden that's a preponderance of evidence, more likely than not, which is a lower bar than the criminal bar, which is why. Uh, we can take action in the student conduct code when, in fact, the county or appropriate charging attorney decides not to prosecute. I have, um, well, I, there's another question down in the front here. I can't see him. Hi, I'm, I'm Deborah Levis Levison. I'm on the faculty of the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. And um, as you know, the online classroom management software that we use here at the university is Moodle. It's my understanding that Moodle is going away, that this seems to be happening with much without much faculty involvement or e even much faculty knowledge in order to join the Unison Consortium in using Canvas. In so doing, we're going to be moving from open source to proprietary software, which seems contrary to a land grant mission in my view. I mean, we're going to be outsourcing software that's critical to our teaching mission without knowing how decisions will be made and its management. This conversion is going to be extremely costly, to, especially to some units more than others, um, not only in staff time, but also in opportunity cost of faculty time. And, and so I would like to request from you more um, transparency from Central and much more openness and discussions about the potential problems with Moodle now and how those might be fixed in addition to the possibilities for moving to Canvas. Sure. Um, I'm looking for uh, Bernie. Golovchuk, who is our IT vice president, and he's chosen not to come today. So <laughs> um, I, I will tell you that I am aware that that is a, is a transition that is being planned. I have, and, and I'm just quite surprised that um, there ha your view is, and therefore it has not been uh, adequately uh, consulted. My understanding was there is a community of practice around this and that there was a lot uh, of discussion, uh, it perhaps didn't penetrate as far as it as it as it could have. So we will take that message back to uh, 
uh, to Bernie, and uh, I'll have him get in touch with you, and we'll begin to, to understand why the community is not, uh, is not uh, as well informed about that as it should be. Uh, it does promise uh, an increase in functionality and ultimately uh, a lower cost because we'll be using an external source rather than maintaining it our, ourselves. But um, that's a miss on our part, and I will have Bernie uh, be in touch with you and, and actually with, with faculty uh, governance to be sure we get that right. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. I want to come back to a couple of questions that, that were submitted. Um, Two back-to-back -back questions. Uh, one is shorter, one's a little longer, and the longer one has a, a wee uh, comment associated with it, but I think they'll, they'll go together nicely. So the first question, how important do you believe a successful football program is to our university? And the second question, uh, what initiatives do you have planned moving into the next biennium to shift the external messaging of the university away from the hyper-focus on all things go for sports towards all things that make a research university great. If I never read another Star Tribune headline about the misconduct among sports teams campus, it will be too soon. Yeah, I gotta agree. I don't wanna see any more of those headlines either. Um, you know, the fact is in American culture, uh, there is a, an interest in college athletics. Uh, there's an interest in, uh, in a large number of, uh, of our alumni and fans uh, that our sports teams uh, do well. It's an important, uh, part of, of what they do. It's an important way in which uh, many people see uh, the university. So uh, we are uh, a member of the Big Ten Conference, which is the uh, athletically and academically uh, most distinguished uh, collection of, of universities in, in the country. Uh, and if we're in that conference, uh, I think we're in it to win. We're not in it to just get our brains beaten out uh, on, the, on the fields. We can make a decision to not play sports or to go to Division II or Division III model. We haven't made uh, that decision. I don't think there's much appetite for making that decision. So being successful in those venues, just as being successful in all other things that we do, I do think is, is important. So as a part of our overall um, place in our society, I think having, having winning sports teams is important. What is deeply frustrating uh, is that we spend a great deal of effort telling the story about all of the magnificent things that we do here in, in, in culture, in art, in, in, in science, and in medicine. Um, but just, just to rub the irony in for you on this point, uh, ben He uh, in biomedical engineering has been working for a long time and using a skull cap of electrodes to pick up brain waves and use them to fly robots and recently to move a, a biomechanical uh, arm, an enormous uh, benefit to an amputee or a, or a, uh, a victim of a disease. Um, and that was set to run above the fold in the Sunday paper of the Star Tribune. You may remember perhaps, that it was below the fold in the Star Tribune because we had a football scandal story that bumped. So your correspondent is no more eager to see more of those headlines uh, than I am. But it goes to culture change. It goes to getting the, the right people, a Mark Coyle, a P.J. Fleck, in charge of those, those systems, owning uh, that behavior and turning it around. Uh, much, frankly, as Richard Pitino has done uh, for our basketball team over the past year. Great. Um, sorry, I lost my place. Okay, uh, another kind of longer question. Um, discussion about reforming the current liberal ed requirement uh, curriculum is underway, and it will unfold against, uh, amidst nationwide trends mirrored at the University of Minnesota of declining enrollment in the arts and humanities and increases in STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, math. As an engineer who has nevertheless made clear your belief in the core importance of liberal arts in any truly great university, can you discuss the place of the arts and humanities at UMN and your hopes for the new liberal education curriculum? So um, my hope for the new liberal education uh, curriculum uh, is really pretty simple. Uh, I think it should be uh, forward-looking, embrace where we are now in society, reach deeply back into, into our past, uh, and equip our students with the knowledge they need to be literate, but the skills they need uh, to be successful in this world. And I mentioned some of them, interpersonal skills, the ability to communicate, um, the ability to understand who we are and how we interact with others. Uh, these are incredibly important, essential skills for anybody, regardless of what their major is. 
So I think there will continue to be uh, an enormous teaching and mentoring opportunity and responsibility uh, for our liberal arts colleagues, even as enrollments in those majors may in fact wax and wane as they, as they, do, uh, as they do through history. So I'm, I'm incredibly excited that we are at the, the place in the sort of the accreditation cycle that we're, we're opening up these liberal education um, uh, conversations and thinking about uh, what we need to do to equip our students. The other thing I will say about this, and this will make some of you maybe a little bit mad, we, and, and you know, I've been a faculty member for 35 years. Um, wow. Um, we need to really resist this desire to identify our course, my course, as part of a liberal education curriculum so that we can count it and get more enrollments and, and, and continue to teach that class. I would like us to be strict and disciplined about being able to define what, what, what is needed, what skill we're attempting to impart to our students in that liberal education requirement and not let it be diluted by things creeping in. So that may be a dream. That may be easier than, harder than mandatory training. But Question please. back here, gentlemen back here. Hi, my name is Hunter Peterson. Um, I'm an MSA at large representative. Um, in your prepared remarks, you said that part of fighting sexual assault on campus is going to be uh, pushing for uh, education for students beyond their first year at the right. university. I'm just curious, uh, what specific steps or what groups are you working with to accomplish this? We are, are in the, the planning and implementation stage. So again, we will involve MSA, we will involve Res Life, we will involve uh, Greek Life. Uh, student affairs broadly to be sure that we're, we're doing two things. One is getting uh, to the students who, who need the training and being sure that the training is, is effective. And unfortunately, you know, sitting and saying, okay, I'm going to watch a, a, a video module or an online thing for 30 minutes and check the box and go, I mean, that is in fact better than nothing, but not by a whole lot. I mean, what we need to do is be able to have smaller groups, facilitated discussions about bystander intervention and about uh, uh, expectations about what affirmative consent means, what does it mean when you stop giving affirmative consent, those kind of, of honest conversations. And it's going to take a while for us to build the kind of infrastructure uh, that we'll need to make, it, to make a real difference. But we sure won't get there if we don't start. So we're going to start. OK, over here. Um, President Kaler, hello. Uh, in your uh, remarks to the House Higher Ed Committee yesterday, you mentioned your intention uh, to increase uh, out-of-state uh, tuition uh, for new students by 10% and 5.5% for current students. So I was wondering um, why uh, the student government wasn't looped in on this administration request. Um, I know that we've had a better partnership this year than other years, but it was really curious why. Yeah, we didn't that, hear about that's that. that's completely fair, Will. And I got it. You were you were there, so I got kind of squeezed into a, a need to say that to that committee before we've had a chance to to do that all here. It's a very preliminary situation. We haven't even finished building our our budget. The regions haven't had a chance to discuss this in any in any re de real detail. Um, you know, as we as we socialized this last year. Um, and we went to an MSA forum, and, and we had a lot of, of uh, conversation around that with the out-of-state, non-resident, non-reciprocity state students. Uh, and I think we had a, left a pretty clear impression that this was a process as we, as we tried to get our out-of-state tuition to be closer to the middle of the Big Ten or at the middle of the Big, of the Big Ten. So I think it's, uh, it's true. We haven't talked about it with this particular set, but, but people who've been around for a while shouldn't have been surprised. Uh, by that, but we are um, winding up, and we will be discussing and consulting uh, that um, that with student government. But it's fair criticism. But I got kind of in a box that I didn't want to be in. We have time for one last question, and, and it really loops in several um, things that we received around tuition and rising tuition. And 
kind of a, I, it struck me very poignantly. As a freshman, uh, myself and many other students like me are concerned that the current political climate in the United States might potentially mean a loss of federal funding for the university and consequently result in fewer resources for us to use in our training. How can you assure us that we will continue to receive a quality education even if the university does receive a loss in funding? I cannot assure you that that will happen. Uh, I, I think that there, there are some kind of nuclear winter scenarios that, that, uh, that sit out there. And, um, you know, if we were to lose uh, Title IV funding or Title IX, um, Title III, there's a whole bunch of titles that, that are, are particular things. Pell Grants. You know, we would be uh, unable to provide Pell Grants for our, our students. That's, I think, about a $25 million a year spend. Um, that's going to dramatically impact students' ability to come uh, to the university. And if you look at, at suppose, as, as um, was suggested might happen to Berkeley, that they're not eligible for federal research grants. That's, that's a $700-plus million a year hit to the University of Minnesota. So as I said, these are nuclear winter things out there. They're really unlikely uh, to happen. But you know what we really need to understand here is that all of these funding sources, federal funding, state support, our ability to, to, to hold a lid on tuition as much as we can, all of these are linked together. And if you talk about pulling one really important piece away is an act of punishment or peak or policy, that's disastrous for universities like us. Well, President Keller, thanks for your time. Thank I, you. Thank you to the audience for your participation. I wish you all a pleasant rest of the afternoon. Thank you for coming.